the attention and the focus on the model of care and ensuring that nurses are at the center of every interaction with the patient is something that I think why the James is so successful at delivering high quality, safe care. This is the James Cancer Free World podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Steve Wartenberg, and my guest is Corinne Steinauer. Corinne is the new chief nursing officer of the James. She began this important role in May, and we're just now meeting for the first time, so I'm excited to learn all about Corinne's background and career, her decision to come to the James in this important leadership position, and learn more about why James nurses are such an important part of patient care. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Steve. I'm happy to be here today. Well, great. I, I always love to talk to new employees in, in these important positions and get a little bit of your background. What got you into nursing, into science and patient care and oncology? Yeah. Well, I'll say um, I did not know what I wanted to do as a, as a kid. Um, I'm not one of those people that started nursing and, and you know, knew I was always going to be a nurse. Um, I didn't ask for you know, the nurse's kit when I was five or six years old, like a lot of my colleagues um, have done in their past. Um, I actually, in high school, I fell in love with chemistry. Um, so my teacher said, you know, you're doing a really great job in chemistry. Um, have you thought about a career as a pharmacist? And this was my junior year in high school. And I said, oh, yeah, that's cool. I think I could be a pharmacist without ever really, you know, knowing or thinking or understanding what that job meant. Um, and so I applied for Purdue. I got early acceptance. I was accepted into the School of Pharmacy and finished my junior year and senior year in high school and went to Purdue and I was all ready to be a pharmacist until um, I started to take organic chemistry and I realized, oh, <laughs> there's a lot more to this chemistry stuff than what I really um, under, uh, understood going into it. Um, and so then I quickly started, you know, looking around to change my major. <laughs> and, that, and that's when I, I was like, oh, well, gosh, the really smart, the smart kids at Purdue, they either go to engineering school or they go to nursing school. Um, and I knew engineering wasn't for me. So I was like, oh, pharmacy, nursing, kind of similar things. Let me try it out this nursing thing. Um, and that's, that's kind of where my story began. Um, I started um, changing my major, went through that whole process, went, uh, got accepted to the school of nursing. Um, and then my in the summer between my junior and senior year um, at Purdue, I had an opportunity to go do a summer externship at the Methodist Hospital in Houston. Um, it was a program where they only took 20 nurses um, from across the country. I thought I was going to go to solid organ transplant, or at least that was my plan uh, when I was applying for the position. Um, but when the recruiter called me, she said, Oh, we just filled our slot for the solid transplant. So you have two choices. You can either do oncology or you can go, uh, to the acute kidney nephrology unit. I didn't want anything to do with nephrology. Um, and so I was like, okay, I guess oncology is, is where I'm going to go. Um, so. Wow. So if you had done better in organic chemistry and if there had been an opening in solid tumors, you would have had, may have had a different career path. If I, yeah, if I had <laughs> found, yep, you're exactly right. Could have been a pharmacist and um, not solid tumors, but solid organs. So solid, oh, organs. solid organs transplant. Oh, as yeah. opposed to like liquid organ transplants, which is more, oh, so it, it is, Oncology it, focused. it's amazing how we all sort of find our way, not even by purpose, but by chance to what maybe we were meant to do. <laughs> yep. So, and that's the summer where I really fell in love with the oncology patient population. Um, my preceptor that summer was a woman, her name was Penny Love. Um, and she's stereotypical, everything you think of when you think of a, of a Southern Texas woman, big red hair, never left her house without her full face makeup, was just pristine in her, in her appearance. Um, but she was the best preceptor and first entree to nursing that I could have ever asked for. Um, so what, Penny what, and I worked elbow. Yeah. What, what does that word mean? Preceptor? Preceptor. So she was the person that um, showed me the ropes on the units. 
I think probably the most important thing she taught me. So two really important things. She taught me how to um, manage my time. Um, we, we oftentimes have five to six patients um, in our patient assignment. So I got really good at, at being able to manage my time and get, get to all of those five to six patients. And then the other thing I think she, she taught me was how to build relationships with patients, which we'll probably talk about a little bit later when we start to talk about relationship-based care. Yeah, that building relationships with patients is like a craft that you learn mm -hmm. by doing it and having good mentors. So preceptor basically means mentor, is that right? She's the yeah. one, okay, she was assigned to be your mentor preceptor. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, and we had a patient um, one day, um, we were coming in, we were getting report. So we were in the, in the nurse's conference room, we were getting report. And the nurse manager came in and told us, you know, Penny and Corinne, this, you know, one particular patient wasn't very happy with the care they had gotten the day before. It was one day Penny, Penny was off. So I was with a different nurse. Um, so it was me and this other nurse and, and the patient, and the family weren't really happy with their care. And I started to get a little huffy and I was like, I gave them really great care. I made sure I did everything. And so Penny pulled me to the side and she said, listen, you can go in that room with the attitude that you have in this moment. And I'm, I'm telling you, your relationship is not going to be, you know, what you want it to be. Or you can go in and, you know, be kind and be there for the patient and, you know, accept their criticisms and their critiques and just try and do, do a better job today. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do it Penny's way, despite I wanted to do it my way. And she was right. Um, I actually, by the end of the time that patient was getting ready to leave, they had bought uh, Penny and I like a huge chocolate cake. And they were extremely grateful. And anytime um, they could, they were requesting that, that Penny and I were taking care of them. So um, that was a really important first lesson I learned early on in my nursing career that, you know, the patient's perception is important. Um, and it, we need to just listen and have an open mind to what they're experiencing um, and make sure that we are, you know, meeting their needs and adapting our care to what the patients and the families are needing. Yeah. Learning how to listen is always a, a key lesson. Yep. And, yeah. and you really, you advanced through the ranks and uh, before coming here to the James, um, let me see if I get this right. You were at the University of Chicago Medicine Ingalls Memorial Hospital, where you were the vice president of patient care services and chief nursing officer. That is correct. Wow. So, that so a, yeah, that was my role just prior to coming here as at the at the James. So what made you decide to come here? So I had a roommate in college um, who was an employee at the James. She's since moved on and is at MD Anderson. Um, but that was my, my greatest experience was, you know, through her, we would get together every once in a while. Um, we would have girls weekends and we would talk about our work. Um, and she would always tell me about the great work that was going on at the James. And so again, I kind of always known about the James. I had always known about their excellence in, in cancer care. Um, I knew about the prestige of, of Ohio State University um, Medical Center. So it wasn't lost on me that this would be an opportunity to, you know, step into um, a, a, again, a unique role in a cancer um, dedicated organization, um, you know, bigger organization, um, greater visibility, um, greater challenges, you know, with bigger scope and scale come bigger challenges. Um, and so that was something that I felt I was ready to, to take on those challenges. Okay, great. We're going to take a quick break. And when we when we come back, we're going to hear all about exactly what the chief nursing officer at the James does, your job description. In today's world, misinformation abounds. But at the Ohio State Health and Discovery website, we're addressing today's most relevant health, wellness, science, and research topics all from the Ohio State experts you can trust. 
we're tapping into physicians, scientists, and thought leaders across our medical center and health sciences colleges to give you the deeper story behind the headlines and the truth about the topics affecting the health of individuals, society, and the world. Visit health.osu.edu today. We're back with Corinne Steinauer, the new chief nursing officer here at the James. And as I mentioned, your title is chief nursing officer. What exactly does that mean? What is your your job description? Oh, gosh. Well, um, I think first and foremost, um, as a chief nursing officer, my job is to help advocate for patients and families through our staff and and really understanding what our staff needs are. So, um, you know, that comes in the form of attending senior leader meetings where uh, my role is to advocate on behalf of our staff and our patients and families. That comes to attending board meetings um, for a similar reason. So, you know, thinking about kind of a 360 view of what is it that we need to do to take care of patients? Are, you know, is it people resources? Is it financial resources? Is it equipment resources? Um, you know, and then the whole pro- professional practice um, continuum that goes along with that. So how do we train and develop and make sure our nurses are skilled and competent? How do we, um, adhere to our evidence-based practice guidelines? How, how do we advance nursing science and you know, become innovators and researchers and continue to push um, evidence-based practice out there? Um, there's certainly you know, diversity, equity, inclusion pieces in, in this role. So thinking about how do we advocate for access to care, um, you know, overcoming social determinants of health for our patients so that they can continue to have access to care. Um, So that's quite a list. (laughs) It's a list, right? And then there's all the HR pieces in there as well, right? So whenever you're you're managing or, or leading, you know, people, you've got that complex network of, um, you know, HR needs that, that come along with that as well. So Help me envision in my mind, when you say your staff that you oversee and lead, how many people do you lead? How many people are on the nursing staff? Oh, gosh, I would say it's probably upwards of about 1,500, probably maybe even more. Um, you know, that number kind of fluctuates every every so often, but oh, large groups of nurses that report up through me, you know, we have the adult in, acute inpatient hospital, um, the ambulatory uh, folks, the advanced practice nurses, all of the nurses that support our professional practice and professional development. So, you know, kind of starts to blossom and get bigger and bigger as, as those rings go out. 1500 nurses. So, uh, I'll give you another couple months and then you'll have memorized everyone's name, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I can memorize about 20 names at a time. So there's, there's, there's an advanced practice skill you have right there. Yeah, yeah. So you've, you've done this a little, you just did it. So, and I know this is hard because there's almost an endless number of different types of nurses, are like sectors and sections. Like, is there a way to break it down into four or five ways that people can understand the different broad types of nurses that there are, that there are at the James or at any oncology hospital, cancer hospital? Well, I'll start by saying, you know, that's one of the the great things about the profession of nursing. Um, There are so many different avenues that you can go into. um, And oftentimes things that that people don't even uh, think of. Uh, But to your question, and I'll try and categorize them into larger buckets. So um, one of the larger buckets would be the acute care um, nursing. So think of nurses that are in the hospital. So those would be um, any of the nurses on the inpatient units, your critical care nurses, um, your emergency department nurses, any of of those nurses. Then for, you have, in, for people who are in the in the hospital being treated or staying overnight or longer. Correct. Yep. 
Then we have perioperative nurses. So those would be nurses that, um, you know, start with the intake process. So you, you oftentimes have nurses that will call patients and give them education and instructions before their surgery. Then you have the nurses that prep the patients for their surgery or procedure when they come in. Then you have the nurses that um, are with the patients while their procedure is happening. And then you have the, the post PACU nurses or post acute uh, recovery um, nurses. So that's another group of nurses. Um, then we have our ambulatory nurses. So those are the nurses that are part of the care, care setting when you go to see your physician in the office or your provider in the office. Um, and they're, you know, focused outside of the hospital. Um, we have infusion nurses here, which is infusion nurses are kind of an offshoot of ambulatory, but those would be the nurses that uh, take care of patients in any of our infusion clinics, administering uh, chemotherapy or um, any medications that the patients would need to receive as part of their, um, you know, cancer regimen. With our professional practice nurses, that rounds out the, the large buckets. Although I'm saying that, I think there's one more group. So case managers um, is another group of, of nurses. Um, and those are the nurses that help plan the patient's discharge um, in the ambulatory setting. They also help plan the patient's kind of continuing um, appointments and provide any education and, and discharge um, instructions the patients would need. Uh, so that's those are kind of the biggest buckets. So I can see how it adds up to 1500. And it's mm -hmm. I don't know what the ratio is. It must be three to one, four to one, five to one from nurses to physicians and for good reason. Yeah, I think if you think about how many touch points, um, you know, the nurses have with a patient, um, that's, I think, where you back into those numbers and, and why there's so many of them. Um, and that, I guess I would say, is one of the biggest differences so far that I've seen here at the James from in my previous organization um, and not to say one is better than the other or, you know, good or different. Um, but the, the attention and the focus on the model of care and ensuring that nurses are at the center of every interaction with the patient is something that I think why the James is so successful at delivering high quality safe care. Um, we haven't measured that yet. I think there's probably a research study that we could do to, to measure that. Um, but I'm pretty confident that that has a lot of the impacts and, and downstream implications for, you know, having high quality care. Is that that concept of patient based care that we've talked about with some previous nurses on the podcast? So, yeah, so we're talking about um, our model of care, which is relationship-based care. So you've got um, the model, which would be you have um, the relationship with yourself as the care provider, a relationship with the patient, your relationship with your colleagues, and then the relationship with the community. Um, and so, again, I think unique in that um, my former organization was patient-centered care. So the difference between those two models is, you know, patient-centered care, the patient's at the center and everything focuses around the patient. In the model of care here in this organization, relationship-based care, you have those four different components of the model, self, colleague, patient, community, and they all intertwine and intersect with one another ultimately to make sure the patient gets, you know, the right level of care and, and great outcomes. Um, and so how I think of it is if you're not taking care of yourself and you're not being mindful of the things that you need, then you can't come to work and be an effective colleague. Um, and if you can't be an effective colleague, then you can't take care of the patient together as, as the patient needs. And if we're not taking care of the patients, then our community is going to suffer. Said the reverse and in a positive way, take care of yourself, then you can take care of your colleagues, then you can be a good team member and take care of our patients, but then ultimately impacts the community and we start to see how outcomes change at the community level. 
Yes, thanks for correcting me. What I meant to ask you is what is the, is this the concept of a relationship based care that is the foundation at the James and so Amy Reddick might be mad at me for saying that wrong so Amy I'm sorry, but Corinne thanks for setting me straight. No worries. And um, so you're new and you're still meeting all your 1500 people and working uh, to meet to learn all about the James and but what are some ideas you might have or some different training or a different approach that down the road or even now you've started or or plan to start um the current nursing strategic plan for the james goes through 2023 um so we're we're right on track and target to build the next um evolution of our strategic plan and so i don't want to say what i want but i think we'll create it together as a community of nurses um, you know, here at the James, I think anticipating to see focus on recruitment, um, since so many organizations are struggling uh, with, with having, you know, so many vacancies um, post pandemic, the James is one of those We're you know, we're not unique. Um, I think we'll likely focus on retention. So how are we making sure that, you know, the staff who come to work here want to stay and continue to work here? We're going to help and try to, you know, continue the organization's um, goals of being a top five cancer center, according to U.S. News and World Report. Um, so, you know, and all of that needs a lot of, you know, leadership informal leadership at the staff level and former formal leadership, um, you know, those individuals that have formal leadership titles. Titles. Now, when you talk about your nursing strategic plan, I'm guessing that you have to work very closely with the physician scientist side of it, because as, for example, the Pelotani Institute of Immunocology builds up and you, more and more immunotherapies are used and the new um, proton radiation um, center opens, you need your nurses need to learn the new skills as the cancer treatment and science advances, they keep up um, with the doctors and scientists. That's correct. And that's why, you know, the, the branch of the professional practice um, area is so integral and uh, needs to be intimately involved with us, you know, making sure that we've got our clinical nurse specialists, our nursing scientists, our nurse educators, um, you know, kind of all focused on how do we develop uh, this, this, you know, community of nurses and making sure that we're staying uh, relevant, um, up to date and practicing according to the latest evidence-based practice guidelines. So when my bucket is getting low, um, a great quick fix for me to, to recharge and re-energize is, is to go out to one of the units. Um, when I first started back in May, probably May and June, I spent a lot of time shadowing several of our, our frontline nurses. Um, so that's always a good dose of connecting back to purpose and, and making sure I'm staying connected with the why. Um, for me, though, I think the greatest sense of joy I have is in developing my leaders. Um, and so I get really excited when I see someone that is having a real big challenge. Um, they come to me, we talk it out, we make a plan, and then um, seeing them, you know, work their way through that. Um, and I almost wanted to say successfully work their way through that, but I hesitated for a moment because, you know, I think one of the things we need to continue to do is celebrate our failures too, right? And, and really understanding the, the lessons that we learn when we fail um, sometimes are almost just as important, if not, you know, more important than when we're super successful. Yeah, the, the failures stick with you and motivate you, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have to make, can I make a plug real quick? Sure. For the American Cancer Society. So um, I'm on the executive uh, steering committee for uh, making strides against brain, breast cancer. Um, so the uh, walk is October 8th. So if anybody is interested in joining, please join teams, team the James. Um, we'd love to have a great showing at that event um, and supporting the American Cancer Society for finding the cure for breast cancer. If people want to find that website, what should they look for to sign up? 
Um, they can go to the American Cancer Society and they could go to the Making Strides Against Breast Cancer website, just Google that. Um, and then they can click on a team and they should search for uh, the, the James. There's a team called the James. Okay. If everyone out there is listening and you want to sign up, that's how you do it. Okay. Yep. Thanks again. All right. This podcast is brought to you by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. For more information, check out our website, cancer.osu.edu.